Today on the Aim High podcast, I'm thrilled to have Joel Friedman joining me for an insightful conversation about his decades of experience in the industrial real estate market. Joel's journey in real estate began in 1981, and since then, he's bought and sold over 100 industrial buildings across the United States. He shares his laser-focused approach to investing in Chicago's industrial market and his unique strategy of using little or no debt in his deals. Throughout our discussion, Joel opens up about the challenges he's faced, including a devastating loss in the 2008 financial crisis. He shares valuable lessons he's learned and how they've shaped his conservative approach to investing. We're also going to dive into the importance of building strong relationships and the power of active listening in both business and personal life. Joel's wisdom and experience shine through as he shares his insights on what truly matters when it comes to success and happiness. So whether you're a seasoned investor or just starting out, this episode is packed with valuable advice and inspiration to help you navigate the world of real estate investing. Where we provide real estate investors with the tools to achieve generational wealth. This is the Aim High Podcast. Let's aim high together on episode 77. Hello and welcome to the Aim High Podcast. Today I'm joined by Joel Friedland. How are you, Joel? Doing great, bud. Nice to see you. Uh, it's nice to see you as well. You've been doing this for quite some time, uh, you know, in the real estate industry, in multiple facets of the real estate industry, um, commercial, industrial, brokerage. Give me a favor. Give me a quick rundown. Yeah, sure. Um, I graduated from uh, the University of Michigan at age 22 um, in 1981. I'm 64 now. And I went to work as a leasing agent for a family that owned 84 industrial buildings. And I didn't know anything about industrial. The family hired me. Uh, interest rates were 17% in 1981. The market was just being crushed. The industrial real estate market, which is all I do, industrial. And uh, the family had some vacancies, and my job was to fill the vacant industrial buildings with manufacturers, distributors, and service companies. So I cold called in industrial parks in the Chicago area to find tenants. Literally, like I'd, I'd walk into a, the front door of a company and I'd say to the person sitting at the front desk, Hey, who do I talk to about whether you guys might be looking to move your company because I have a building two doors away and I'd love you to move into it and move out of this dump. <laughs> I'd say something like that, you know, just to be funny. Yeah. Uh, one time I called a place a dump and the uh, two people sitting in the front said, we'll be right back. And they came back with a dad in a wheelchair and the dad said, who called my building a dump? And I said, oh, no, I was just kidding. And he said, boys, take them out. So the two big sons, about 6'4 and 6'6, six, six, picked me up, one under one arm, one under the other, and they carried me out the front door and threw me on the asphalt parking lot. And I landed on my knee and cut my pants. And they said, and never come back. That That's the only time I've actually gotten physically thrown out of a cold call in person. But that's what I did. I cold called. And then I started um, syndicating because the family was syndicators and they taught me how to do it. And they put the money up in the beginning to help me do it. So I started buying industrial buildings with partners. And since then, uh, I bought 100 industrial buildings, uh, Ohio, New York, Florida, and the Chicago area. And um, still to this day, I'm raising money every day in chunks of 50 and a hundred thousand to go buy buildings for a couple million dollars each. Awesome. And how much do you have right now overall? We have 19 buildings. We've got uh, three of them are multi-tenant and the rest are single tenant. Uh, so we've got 22 or 23 tenants. It's, it's a small operation, but the buildings can be expensive. Some We have one building that's worth 16 million. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I I don't see in, industrial going away anytime soon. I know that there's a kind of a push against office space right now. Yeah. Um, but what is your feeling on the on the industrial market as a whole? It's hotter than hot. Rents have gone up uh, eighty percent in the last four years. Mm -hmm. That's an average rent growth of twenty percent a year. Uh, industrial is very sought after by investors pension funds, insurance companies, and individuals. But there's not a lot of it available because many companies are in their own buildings that they own and they're not looking to move. So they're, it, it's very clogged up in terms of, 
us being able to buy more now, there's almost nothing available. Amazon, for example, came into the markets and took literally 100 million square feet around the country. Mm -hmm. In Chicago, maybe 5 million square feet, roughly. Uh, other companies that use big warehouses like that, we don't, don't we don't buy those kind of buildings. The kind you see on the side of the of the highway, that's not what we do. Okay. You know, I know in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, all over East Coast, West Coast, uh, Florida, Carolinas, everywhere. It's the, the industrial market is hot as hell. New buildings are built and they fill up as fast as they get built. Those are called A industrial buildings, class A. We buy the old brick buildings that were built in the 80s mm -hmm. and 90s. They're smaller and uh, they're not as pretty, but they work. Financially, right. we, we try to buy buildings where our investors can make an unlevered 7 or 8% return. Great. W what does your buy box look like as a whole, if you don't mind going into it a little bit? Well, we're laser focused now only on Chicago because we're experts here. We were not experts in the other markets. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're super laser focused, um, you can do better than jumping all over the country and pretending that everything always goes up because it doesn't. So our buy box is 10,000 square foot buildings here up to call it maybe 40,000 square feet smaller buildings they're they're worth about a hundred dollars a square foot so uh a little building ten thousand feet's a million dollar building mm -hmm. and thirty thousand square feet is a three million dollar building and we buy mostly single tenant and we've got fabulous tenants what people do in industrial buildings is, is just so cool yeah. yeah we've got we've got a tenant who uh makes protein bars he was on shark tank in year one uh um, nice. we've got instacart we have a u.s postal service uh warehouse uh we have at t they have a fleet of vans that they have in our building and then we've got manufacturers who make metal parts for airplanes and magnets for computers and things like that that's awesome that takes my next question which was can you tell me any of the people that you have living in your buildings now um, curious enough when you're when you're trying to acquire these things or you're actually in the acquisition process what kind of money are you using are you agency money and what are the rates like in industrial we don't borrow oh okay so you're How about oh, this? we are we are the weirdest uh syndicator in the united states i believe there's four thousand syndicators with 50 million or more in assets in the united states we are probably the only one that doesn't use debt. We occasionally we do, but our maximum loan to value ratio is 30%. Okay. And, and it's, there's a reason for it. We're not total idiots because real estate is a leverage business. I know you use leverage and I, I, I understand why, but in my case, I went through four down cycles and in 2008, I devastatingly went into a spiral that I couldn't get out of. We owed money to seven banks. Mm -hmm. I had personal guarantees on 50 loans and I had to work tooth and nail not to go bankrupt and to bring everything back from the brink of just devastation to being healthy again. And I made a decision that I and maybe a bunch of people that I could find might like doing deals that are super, super safe with a little corner of their portfolio. Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone to invest more than 3% of their net worth with me if they're syndicated investors. You know, they should, they should spread it all over the place. But um, in my case, I don't have the temperament or the tolerance for losing money. And I know, you know, it's so funny, people would say, um, Joel, why don't you borrow? You know, rates are 3%. They're 4%. If you're floating, they're two and a half. And I said, they could go up to 17. They said, there's no way. It'll never go above four or five. That's, <laughs> that's what it is. And I said, you know what? I've been through four down cycles. And when I started, rates were 17%. And don't say never. 
you know, you, you as a military guy know this really well. And I know that there, there are some mentors that you've had that have been very strategic in how, how the military decisions are made. Mm-hmm. You've taught you that and you've learned it from experience. I wasn't in the military, but I was in a, in a battle. I was in a battle for, for my family's financial um, well-being and my investors' financial well-being. And when someone says that can never happen, you know from your experience, you've seen things that shouldn't have happened that mm-hmm. happened. You know, yeah, you people think- forget that in any in any situation, the enemy gets a vote. You know, <laughs> even the best laid plans can sometimes be unraveled. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm fully, I'm fully aware of that. And listen, I, I watched, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a little older, uh, n- not as, you know, not, not as uh, seasoned as you. However, I did live through the Carter administration and did watch my father's business go upside down with an, with an arm, um, you know, where he, he went from, you know, skyrocketed up to that 17 to 20% range and just tanked, tanked his company. So um, what prompted you in 91 to break away from this other company and start your own business? Well, it was a family and I, I loved them. It was a father, Milt, and two sons, Steve and Randy, and a, a daughter, Bonnie. To say that I loved them is a huge understatement. I felt like I was part of the family. The only thing I, is I wasn't part of the family. So I, I knew I would never have a meaningful ownership position in the family, and they were very much control freaks. And as much as I loved them, I couldn't stay there because at age 31, I was entrepreneurial, and I wanted to go do my own thing or have a meaningful piece of their thing. And I couldn't have a meaningful piece of theirs. So I decided to go start my own business with uh, three other guys all industrial um, brokers and developers like myself. And I left on incredibly good terms. And Steve Podowski, who's the oldest son from that family I work for, he's still a mentor to me today in his 70s. I haven't talked to him since yesterday. And whenever I make a major decision, I call Steve and he is a partner, an investor in all of my new deals. So that's, imagine a 42 year relationship that's still going mentor mentee by the way i mentor him a little now too but he doesn't admit it he says no 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 you never mentor me i mentor you <laughs> that's his but listen i i learned from everybody i've learned from you know my airman when i was when i was in charge and I, you never know if you give somebody the hey go ahead and do this and don't give them the you know do it this way you'd be surprised at how they figure stuff out and the things that you can learn from it. Yeah. That's leadership. Yeah. You're talking about you, you're, you're a, you're a leader when you do that. Yeah. Yeah. It it's eye opening. And then like, as uh, you know, Darth said, then the student has become the master, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's my nerd coming through. Um, yeah. Now it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. Can you tell me about a deal that, you know, maybe you had to rescue from the brink of disaster or one that just didn't work out the way you anticipated? Yeah, I'm very open about this. I've I've had 10 major losses out of the 100 deals that we've done. And I don't think that that's unusual. I think anybody who claims that every deal is a winner is a liar. Yeah. There's no such thing. I, I'm a baseball fan. There's nobody who gets up to bat every time and, and either gets a walk or a hit. People strike out. Mm -hmm. And I've had 10 bad deals and they all make me sick. They're all traumatic experiences that when I talk about them, I'm not reliving them because I've come to terms with the fact that not everything's going to be a winner. I had a partner who decided let's do something different than industrial. Let's do retail. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm laser focused on industrial. He said, humor me. So we bought the old RC Cola uh, bottling plant at 47th in California in Chicago. It was 11 acres and they had abandoned it. And the family that owned RC Cola still owned the property. And my partner thought it would make a great retail redevelopment. 
but that wasn't what we knew. And he said, just do it. I'm going to make you a fortune. Just do it. And I raised money for it. And we bought this place simultaneously. We bought a piece of land in a town called Vernon Hills. We bought seven acres also to do a retail development. And we put debt on that. So we had these two properties in 2007 that we didn't know how to make work that had to be developments. And when the market tanked in 2008, there was nothing we could do. They were dead properties. There was nobody mm -hmm. developing anything for the next couple of years. And we were carrying it. We paid the taxes, the insurance, the, the, uh, the maintenance and the mortgages. And it was devastating because I had to explain to um, dozens of investors who had trusted me with their money why I allowed uh, my partner to convince me, and I allowed it, uh, to shift into retail when we were absolute experts at industrial and nothing but industrial. And we lost a million two on the RC plant, and we lost 1.7 million on the land in Vernon Hills. And investors who are with me in those deals are still investors now because they watched how hard we worked to not lose every other dollar we had in 2008. But these were two I couldn't save. Yeah. yeah. How do you recover from a $3 million almost loss? Well, as a syndicator, I've raised hundreds of millions from other investors. So you, it's mental. It, it's, 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 it's really not my money. It was partially my money, but it was 100% my reputation. Mm -hmm. And I was devastated. I went into such a deep, dark place because I had to own up to my mistake. And I had to explain it to people and keep them informed on a very regular basis. The recovery was hard. And part of it was saying, what's my, what did I learn? And I learned that for me, I'm not going to stray from my focus, which is industrial. And I'm also not going to borrow money because if I hadn't borrowed money on those two deals, instead of losing a million two and a million seven or a million one and a million seven, we would have made double or triple that if we had the staying power to survive those years. Yeah. And that's how I get through it. I, I get through it with remembrance and learning that I, I touched a hot stove with my fingers and I'm not going to touch that stove again. And knowing that and explaining it this way to my investors makes me feel like I'm being vulnerable enough to admit that I made a big mistake and that I learned something from it. Yeah. One thing that you said that I'll take away from this conversation was I allowed myself to let that happen. Right. So yeah. that's, that's a credit to you and, and, uh, and your integrity because a lot of people would have said, you know, well, this guy talked me into this or this guy talked me into that. And I, you know, it's not my fault. So I give you a lot of credit for that. Yeah, it took a long time for me to take credit for that because for the longest time while we were in it uh, and it was horrible, I was blaming him instead of taking the blame. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not taking responsibility. I, I said yes, I should have said no. I knew it was wrong for me. And he had helped make a lot of money on a lot of other deals. So I trusted him. And I, I came to this point where he was saying, do you trust me or not? Mm -hmm. And I should have said, not. Instead, yeah. I said, of course I do. Let's do it. And mm -hmm. I knew it was wrong at the time. I just, I allowed it to happen. Yeah. And that's unfortunate because it's not a matter of, do I trust you or not? It's more along the lines of, are we, do I trust you? And we're working within the confines of our expertise. You know, yeah. After having gone through the really difficult period, which was, it required me to learn some things. Meditation, counseling needed to be mm -hmm. part of what I was doing. Uh, I was so depressed that medication was part of what I needed. 
I never want to feel that pain again. The mm. pain, there was a tremendous amount of gain from having all that pain. And the beneficiaries of, of my pain are my family and my investors who know that if they invest with me now, I'm not going to say yes to something that shouldn't be allowed. It's amazing how that works. And then all of a sudden you, you become more conservative with your, with your underwriting. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know you so, do, you do a lot of deals in, in different types of real estate. Um, uh, commercial and multifamily, but primarily residential. Uh huh. Say your main focus right now is. Yes, sir. Yeah. We go from, we're trying, well, not trying. We are working on picking up uh, between one and 30 unit properties. Um, we've, we've struck out at above 10, but we're doing well with the below 10. Um, so it's working out. I remember, I remember hearing you say something about making tons and tons of offers. Mm. And I remember that story. Are you still doing that? Are you making lots of offers? We do right now we are, uh, concentrating on self-management. So we're building a property management company in the South Jersey area. Um, specifically because we were not happy with the way our managers were a lack of communication, which is, you know, unfortunately when you get a warrant issued for your arrest and you're active duty military, it's not one of the best things in the world. Uh, so I got a warrant issued for my arrest for failure to respond to a, to a, an inspection that they missed. And there was a citation issued and it didn't go to me. <laughs> Otherwise I'd have answered it. Um, oh, so man. we fired them. Yeah. We fired them and then moved on. Yeah. We also self-manage. But it's hard to self-manage because you need to pay salaries mm -hmm. uh, to people who are good at what they do and they don't come inexpensively. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. I lose money on my management business. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty much break even right now, which is fine. You know, it's better than paying someone else 10%, but we're breaking even on the 8% that we charge ourselves. <laughs> yeah. We're, we, we charge 4% for our industrial deals and we're, um, let's just say, uh, I, I look at, I have a bank account with a, a low six figure amount of money in it. Mm -hmm. I've already said to myself, that's just money that I'm going to spend this year uh, on managing our properties. That's not going to be reimbursed by the management fees. They're not high enough. Mm -hmm. I love it when an investor says to me, oh, you charge 4% and you manage the properties. You're making a fortune because when you add it up to all the properties, I said, you know what I say to them? I say, tell you what. I'm going to turn over the management company to you and you're going to run it and you can charge the 4%. I'll tell you what, charge five and you take it. And they go, no, yeah. no, 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 no. I get it. No, <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, people don't realize that the, the amount of, so um, I had someone help me with a study a couple of years back when we were looking at self-managing and um, it was before we even made the transition. And essentially, we came to the conclusion that, yes, we're charging 8%, but it's costing us 12. <laughs> That's right. So, I right. charge you four. It's costing me eight. It's, yeah, exactly exactly. It it's exactly costing me double what I'm bringing in. Yeah. So, uh, you know, anyone who says, that, oh, you're making a, yeah, you're, you're not really making anything. And it's a, it's a very, um, you're, you're working a lot. <laughs> it's not, That's it's crazy. It um, is. <laughs> Now, where are you going from here, Joel? Well, I'd like to buy a bunch more industrial buildings in the Chicago area. I currently have offers out on about 20 buildings. I'm guessing I'll get maybe two of them if I'm lucky. And then during due diligence, we're incredibly careful. I've got a, an advisory board of eight of our investors. When we do due diligence, we have these big Zoom meetings with everybody on the call. Mm -hmm. And I ask everyone to ask me their roughest, toughest questions to try to trip us up because if they don't ask before we buy it, the hard due diligence questions, it's too late when you buy it to ask the questions you should have asked earlier. So I want to just make great decisions. You know, Bud, to me, what helps me put my head on the pillow at night and sleep well is using good judgment as opposed to being impulsive and gambling and playing sort of like the fast and loose. I don't, I don't need to worry about details. I'm the big picture guy. I don't want to invest with anybody who's the big picture guy who doesn't know the details. Yeah. I listened to um, 
a, 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 a webinar yesterday, a very famous, well-known syndicator, and he didn't have the answers to the questions that if I didn't have those answers, I wouldn't do the deal. And he mm -hmm. was already raising money for something where he didn't have the answers. Right. And I'm trying to figure out how anyone would invest with him. Because if you don't ask the tough questions, you know, the answers to the difficult ones, those are the ones that are going to trip you up and lose money for you if anything goes bad, if anything goes against you. And so, yeah, these people who invest as, as, as syndicated investors, like in my kinds of deals, and they put up a hundred grand or 200 grand or whatever it is, and they don't know the right questions to ask. They need a consultant yeah. who's really good at asking those questions and says, hey, here are the 10 questions that have not been asked. Let me ask them and get definitive answers and figure out if this syndicator knows what the hell he's doing or if he doesn't. Yeah, and that's not a Henry Ford moment, right? Where Ford is sitting at his desk and he's getting blasted. This, because there are times when I don't know all the answers, but the people that I'm working with do. Um, and that's, you know, it's, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to be surrounded by the rest of the, the other smart people. Um, but in that case, I, I fully agree. I, I don't know that I would invest with that person. But they, they don't know the basics of the, of the, you know, the underwriting that's going on. How can you answer the questions? And I, we used to call them a murder board when you stand there and you're about to do a presentation and you stand in front of a group of, you know, colonels and majors and whatnot. And they're throwing these questions at you because you're about to brief a two-star. Um, in this case, it's the same thing, right? I, I don't know that I would feel comfortable taking someone's money if I didn't have all the answers that they asked. Yeah, this is a multifamily deal that I was looking at, and I'm not mm -hmm. going to invest in it. I, I, I do look at and invest in other people's deals mm -hmm. uh, besides our own for diversification purposes. And what he was explaining yesterday was that this is a return a 7% yield. And on the back end, in two years, they're going to sell the property and they'll make another seven so that you'll make 14 total. So 7% each of the two years, and then 7% for each of those two years from the sale proceeds. So it's like a 28% return right. on your money and your money back in two years. So here's the question that I had that I didn't ask. Because I, if I had to ask the question, that means he didn't present it. And if he's not presenting it, he, he doesn't really expect something horrible to happen. But he said, two years ago, when they first started this deal, they believed that they could sell it for a four cap. And because things have gotten bad in multifamily in that town in the southeast, um, he thinks that they'll eventually sell it for a five cap. And on the five cap, that's where you're making your 14% return annualized. And the question I would want to know is what happens if you sell it for a six cap? Mm -hmm. And he, he sort of glossed over that by saying the worst it's going to be is a five cap because rates are going to go down. And when, when interest rates, when the Fed brings interest rates down, cap rates go down and the Fed's going to cut rates three times this year. That's what they said. No, they did not say that. They were, they said they were thinking about it. Yeah. And it would depend on inflation. You know, you got to listen to Jerome Powell very carefully because what he says can't be black and white. It's gray. He's saying if this, then that, and if, so he never said, oh, for sure, we're cutting rates this year. And by the way, if they do cut rates, it's probably because there's a problem in the economy and they're mm -hmm. trying to save it, which means just because rates go down doesn't mean that cap rates go down. Cap rates could go up even if interest rates go down because there could be a huge vacancy mm -hmm. in the market and there could be lowering of rents because if, if the economy is in trouble, rents don't go up when things are bad, they go down. So they might have lower rents and a higher cap rate at the same time. 
in which case it would be like my Vernon Hills deal. You can lose all your money. It could be all gone. So, yeah. you know, I, I don't like when someone's explaining a deal and they don't explain the worst case. They explain mm -hmm. like, well, the worst case won't happen. Well, okay, but what if it does? How are you prepared for that? And the fact that they want to sell this property in two years also bothers me. I, I know you feel the same way that you, you keep a lot of your stuff. Yeah, most of it. Yeah, Very, very so, rarely do I, do I sell it off. Right. And these syndicators, many of them are in it to make their promote. You know, they make this uh, disproportionate share of the profits on a sale. They make 20 or 30 percent of the profit over the, the preferred return. Mm -hmm. And so if this is such a great project, they, they showed pictures and a video of this multifamily. If it's and they said it's so great, it's it's class A and it's great and it's so well designed and well built. Why are they selling it in two years? Why don't they keep it? Right. And, you know, I think they're afraid to tell syndicated investors that they're long-term holders because they're afraid people will say, well, I don't want to be in for the long term. I'll be dead by then. And I say to people, when you come into my deals, the exit strategy is your death because we're going to own them long term and it'll probably end up being owned by your kids. Mm -hmm. It's generational. And that's how real estate really works. It, it, I think it's gambling to buy stuff with the intent of selling it quick, like a hot potato. Yeah. It's gambling because cap rates can go up. The economy can go down. Rents could go down. Vacancy could be all over the place. I just don't get people who think it's great to have the best property in the world and be trying to get rid of it. Right. And, they're, and then, of course, good. Making the assumptions about the interest rates are just that's by the way, the last two the last two meetings they haven't done anything. They're like, oh, we're gonna see. Okay, right. yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep it stable. I, I watch uh this this thoughtful money podcast with Adam Taggart, which is fantastic. I, I recommend mm -hmm. it so highly. And he's got three shows a week where he interviews top economists and researchers, and some of them think that rates are gonna go up. Mm -hmm. Some of them think that the market's going to crash and rates are going to go up. So there's a lot of negativity out there. And these guys who are so positive that rates are coming down and cap rates will go back to where they used to be and everything will be great again. You know, that's BS. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I honestly don't know. I plan and I underwrite for, you know, for the current and then for the future. The, the pro forma has to be conservative. You can't. I had people underwriting deals and sending them to me at, you know, 5% growth, 10% growth. That's not realistic. 2%, 3% tops, um, you know, interest rates potentially going up here, going up there. Bridge loans. Um, I'm, I'm about to do one on one of the commercial properties only because we're, we know we're going to refinance it for a long-term hold, but I need to do some repairs and I already have three of the properties occupied and I don't want to refinance it all into hard money. So um, we have a 3.25% mortgage on it. So I'll take the bridge loan. Then I'll just refinance the bridge loan into a long-term debt. Um, but sense. we'll still be at that point. And Joel, much like you, I, I only carry, uh, we're at about 55% leveraged. I don't like to be over that, uh, simply because of 2008. Yeah. You know. No, I, I love your philosophy. I, I've, I've seen you interviewed on other people's podcasts and I, I wish we had gotten, maybe we'll do it another time more into your personal uh, philosophies and your thoughts about how to live life and some of your past experiences. I think you've got a, um, a very interesting and compelling story. Thank and you. I think you're really smart in how you do your deals. And I just give you so much credit that you started really doing real estate in earnest in 2018 and you're already where you are now. Um, I, I, I love your story. You are, you. you are like, I have great admiration. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joel, I'm going to ask you the one question. Uh, what have you learned as your wealth increased? Um, relationships are everything. It doesn't matter if you're a billionaire or if you have $10,000 to your name, 
relationships are every my wealthiest investors who are multi-billionaires to them what matters most are the people that they care about who care about them and there's nothing more important than that it goes it transcends money by far yeah thank you very much that is absolutely a perfect perfect uh, answer to that question that's networking is everything and and tight networks are even better so yeah close relationships where you really get to know people and they get to know you and you understand each other and can confide in each other and help each other mm -hmm. and have fun together you know have, yeah. have go out and have lunch and talk about stuff that matters and solve problems you know you know my daughter's got a problem she's looking for a house and she can't find one and she and the kids and the husband are in an apartment and they really want a house but there's nothing available in our market and then i'll be explaining that to some friend of mine at lunch and close friend will say oh my daughter's going through the same thing you know what do we say to them how do we support them in that you know mm -hmm. having that real discussion about things that matter yeah 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 i agree all right Joel, we're going to move on to the soaring four. These are the same four questions that I ask every guest, mostly mindset, that can help someone who is uh, starting out achieve new heights. And question number one is, what keeps you motivated? I just love what I do. I just absolutely love it. I, I, it's Again, it's the relationships. I have relationships with industrial brokers, uh, with tenants, with, in, with my investors, mm -hmm. um, with my kids. Uh, grandkids, the wife, the father-in-law, my mother. I mean, that that motivates me to to work and to work on my relationships to make them better. Perfect. Is there one thing that completely changed your mindset? Something you can put your finger on? Yeah, that's what I told you about earlier. Uh, not needing to take big risk with lots of debt. Mm -hmm. I just got too burned and I just won't do it again. Great. What tools do you use to keep you on track? I've got the best tool in the world. You ready? <laughs> Hit me. It's a word. It's a word. It's W-A-I-T. That is my tool. When I'm talking to somebody often, mm -hmm. I think about one thing. When they're talking to me, listen carefully. When I'm talking, be careful what I say. W-A-I-T stands for why am I talking when I should be listening instead of talking? W-A-I-T. That's outstanding. Why am I talking? <laughs> right. You hear the two ears, one mouth. You should listen twice as much as you talk. I, I, I just like to sit there in the room. <laughs> yeah. You know, at least I'm in the room. So the last question is, if you had to change one thing and start all over, what would it be? I think I would have, from a younger age, uh, valued relationships more and been less afraid of what I was going to say when I was with someone and be more concerned about how I could listen to them and help them. I think I would have had better relationships in high school and in college and in my early years in the business. Uh, you know, it's so hard um, to feel like you've really mastered being with people, mm -hmm. but I really feel like I've become good at it because Dale Carnegie said it best. Uh, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And I love yeah. that. That's great. All right. I, I think that's a great place to close. Yeah. Joel Friedland. Thank you very much for your time. I will have your contact information in the show notes, but thank you. for. I know you're busy, man. And I, I really do appreciate you coming on. This was a fantastic conversation. I'm really glad we did it. Thank you so much.